It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. Thank you for joining with us. My name is Michael Evans, and you're listening to America's Voice Now. Glad that you've joined us. Appreciate your attendance this morning. Well, I tell you, it sure comes hot and heavy these days. It just feels like the, uh, like everywhere you look, the layers and the level of of lawlessness is just so abundant, so abusive, so blatant. And I'm frustrated that Americans across the board seem utterly apathetic to what's happening in our nation. Our four topics this morning will be Obama is, is threatening and, and claims he will veto a bill that Congress is about to vote on that will require him to follow the law. So Congress is going to pass a law that requires the president to follow the law, and he's going to veto that. With all due respect, I am... I mean, there's not much to say if he does this. When government makes the laws, violates them at will, when government holds no respect for the Constitution, and none of them, not Congress, not the executive, not the judicial, follow it, it's time to declare them all dishonorably discharged and remove them with prejudice. Don't leave a single member in office in the House this coming election. If this, if, if this happens, I got to tell you, folks, every senator who is up for election should be removed. Every House member, because they all come up for election, should be removed. In a massive, peaceful, civil, disobedient march on the Capitol that will remove the traitor in chief must be accomplished. I do not understand how America can stand by and watch as our republic is dismantled, moment by moment, block by block, piece by piece. Our second topic will reinforce this. A teenager, 18 years old, in high school, jailed for 13 days for a pocket knife. What's worse, there was no search warrant. They searched his car, they found a pocket knife. They've charged him with a felony. The kid has gone through law enforcement training. He's gone through EMT training. The knife was in an EMT vest in his trunk. They found a stun gun in his car, but it was locked in the glove compartment. They didn't charge him with that because it's not illegal. They're now threatening to ruin. And by the way, he had pre-joined the military, and he was waiting to graduate from high school before entering the military. The military has now basically fired him in advance anticipating or waiting for some word that he's either been adjudicated and found not guilty or what have you. And then when people put up a, well, we're, we're going to talk about it in detail. I'm telling you, guys, if you do, you know, this is insanity. If you do not recognize that we have turned this nation and we have allowed this nation to be turned into a police state, it's because you refuse to live the mask that is blinding you and covering your eyes, covering your ears, and blocking your mouth. You fear the truth. You fear, you fear what must be done because you are complacent. You are apathetic and you are afraid to admit that these actions And what this nation is going through right now will necessitate action on your behalf that will endanger you 
and your comfy cocoon of apathy. The ease with which you live. The cocoon of complacence. And you are acquiescing to the greatest tyranny that could ever be perpetrated on us. America, this is getting beyond the scope of anything that we can tolerate. Our third topic, I'm going to reinforce it again. Eighth graders. Eighth graders in an essay which a parent took umbrage with. They stated that, and the majority of them, stated that they would rather be slaves than factory workers. You know why? Free food and protection. Quote, the majority of the class felt that they would rather be a slave than to be a factory worker. The rationale by those classes, by those class, uh, those, by those students, excuse me, chose slaves because they had free housing, they had free food, and they had free protection. Is is that what we have become? God help us. Our fourth segment, the NSA, the CIA, the surveillance police state. What part of this don't you get? Brand new exposure by Snowden on how the NSA is using Facebook to hack into your computer. How the NSA is infecting millions of computers globally with malware that allows them to gain access and 100% take control of that machine, go in, grab whatever they want. More information as well on the White House and how they tried to mediate this dispute between the CIA and the Senate. ESA is coming out and claiming that the CIA spying on Congress may even be qualified as treason. Ladies and gentlemen, Is this the America that you expected to live in at this time in your life? Is this the America that you want to hand on to your children and your children's children? If you think things are bad now, what will they be like in 5, 10, 20, 50 years? All right, let's tackle our first topic. I, I'm, I'm so disturbed today. I am... Uh, it, it, it's beyond comprehension that we have allowed our nation to turn into this. And I am just... I'm incensed that Americans will not stand... This tyrant is threatening to veto a law that would, for, that would allow Congress to sue him, to force him to follow the law in federal court. He's claiming that it violates the separation of powers by encroaching on his presidential authority. With all due respect, if he followed the Constitution in the first place and faithfully executed the laws as his oath has sworn him to do, this discussion wouldn't need to be had. There would be no necessity to encroach on the separation of powers. But the premise of the separation of powers is that one division of the three can oversee and prevent exactly the type of tyranny that is being perpetrated right now we are in a constitutional crisis, ladies and gentlemen. We are in a fight for our lives. And the lives of this nation. 
despite the fact that 50% of the country is asleep. And, 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 at, and out of that 50%, most of those people are either completely patently unaware because they're loaded up with antidepressants and drugs, illig- legal and illegal. A huge percentage of them are sitting there on the government dole, so anxious to just live a life of ease and complacency that they will lock the bracelets down upon themselves. Gracious, what have we become? The White House Office of Management and Budget says on Wednesday, the power the bill purports to assign to Congress to sue the president over whether he has properly discharged his constitutional obligation to take care that the laws will be faithfully executed exceeds constitutional limitations. Well, With all due respect to the Office of Management and Budget, I would strongly encourage them to read the Constitution again, then reiterate the President's oath, in which he he promised and, and swore an oath. So help him God, whatever God this one believes in, that he would faithfully execute the laws of the United States and defend and protect this nation and this Constitution. They went on to say that Congress may not assign such a power to itself. Neither may the president. Sorry to break your bubble. They went, they went on to say Congress may not assign such power to itself, nor may it assign to the courts the task of resolving such generalized political disputes. Well, my response to that is you're absolutely correct. The the judicial system and the courts have an obligation to step up and take proactive action to prevent tyranny. They have refused to do so. They have abdicated their responsibility under the Constitution. The legislative cannot accomplish it because ideology and partisanship have so set this nation apart, the chasm is forever unbridgeable. Trey Gowdy is the lead sponsor. He says that it's designed to curb Obama's abuse, predominantly related to the Obamacare stuff. He says, we have pursued certain remedies afforded to Congress to address executive overreach, but these efforts have been thwarted. The bill is necessary. It will give Congress the authority to defend this branch of government as the framers and our fellow citizens would expect. Here's the challenge. Right now, every time Congress would attempt to take the president to court, the courts say, you as Congress don't have the standing. See, the courts are hiding behind this argument of standing. And it is a betrayal of their their constitutionally delegated authority and their, not just their authority, but their obligation to preserve and defend the Constitution. The courts are hiding, cowering in the corner. They're so abusive of us, but when it comes to reining in true tyranny, true lawlessness, they are mute. They have made themselves inert, impotent, Another bill out by uh, Ron DeSantis out of Florida would require the administration to explain decisions not to enforce laws. When those decisions are rooted in policy rather than in a constitutional issue. By the way, the Justice Department is already required to do this by law. So Obama's argument on this is that it would, well... Here's what OMB says. The bill would inordinately expand current law, which already talk. I mean, how abusive can you get of our intelligence? 
expand current law. You mean, are you talking about the tens of thousands, the millions of pages of verbal and, and legalese diarrhea you have injected into our society? You mean that law? You mean the law that is so bent and twisted that no one can follow it? Not even the lawyers, not even the people who have written it? You mean the law that's been subverted by your allowance of administrative agencies that have no authority to exist, no constitutional claim to life, that fill it with rules and regulations that parade about as law when they are legally prohibited by the Constitution because no law may be passed by anything or anyone but Congress. You mean that law? The OMB says the bill would inordinately expand current law, which already requires reports to Congress when non-enforcement of federal law is based on constitutional grounds. DeSantis says the American people deserve to know exactly which laws the Obama administration is refusing to enforce and why. The OMB came back and said federal agencies are continually, in, continually engaged in the process of determining how to concentrate limited enforcement resources most effectively. Yeah, you're pointing the spear at us with administrative agencies, federal agencies, that have no authority to exist. We never delegated or subdelegated or allowed Congress to subdelegate our authority to unelected, unnamed, faceless, nameless, unaccountable bureaucrats in literally thousands of federal agencies who pass rules and regulations and promulgate them as if they were law. Ladies and gentlemen, that is treason. They have violated the Constitution. And Congress has allowed it. The courts have allowed it. The president's allowed it. The whole damn lot of them are out of control. The truth is, not a single one of them has a leg to stand on. None of them. Read the Constitution. Read the documentation. Read the Founders' words. Go get your Federalist and your Anti-Federalist papers and understand what they meant. And if you say that that's not pertinent anymore, then there is no rule of law and anything goes. And you may as well just completely abdicate all authority, all rule of law, and just allow a tyrant to take over control. And then like the eighth graders over there in Michigan or wherever that was, you can sit there and safely get your free housing and your free food and your free protection. Don't ask me what the price is. You should know. Mike Lee came out. First of all, Eric Holder, who doesn't have a right to exist as, anybody, as any member of, of government, he told Mike Lee from Utah that he thought Obama was, quote, probably at the height of his constitutional power. And he was referencing the uh, Obama mandate delays that have been implemented unilaterally, illegally, unconstitutionally, without any authorization. But here's the rub. Eric Holder says he can't explain the precise legal analysis. This is the number one law enforcement officer in the country, and he cannot explain what he uses to justify this lawless behavior. Lee says, when you look at the quality, not just the quantity, but the quality, the nature of the executive orders that he has issued, he has usurped an extraordinary amount of authority within the executive branch. This is not precedented. And I point to the delay, the unilateral delay, lawless delay, in my opinion, of the employer mandate as an example of this. 
And so at a minimum, I think he owes us an explanation as to what his legal analysis was. And he's referencing Holder there. Ladies and gentlemen, there is almost no point in continuing these discussions. There is almost no point in my continuing to do this radio program. There is no point to my attempt to awaken America when America wakes up and says, I just want to go back to sleep. I don't care that there's a hurricane approaching. I don't care that there's a tornado taking down the house. I don't care that the ground has opened up and it is swallowing the home and the bed that I'm laying in. I just want to go back to sleep. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no rule of law anymore. Let's face it. We live in a police state. We have already succumbed to tyranny, to lawlessness, to dictatorship, to totalitarianism, to authoritarianism. It's done! And unless you are willing to stand and do something about it, it will only get worse. Yes, I'm angry, but my heart is broken. It is broken for this nation. It is broken for my children and yours, and I don't even know yours. The nation is aflame. And if you refuse to see that, it's because you are unwilling to acknowledge it. Because you fear what will be required of you. You fear what will be required of you because you fear death or you fear loss of what? Loss of what? Your comfy lifestyle, your electronic gizmos, your laziness in, uh, in front of the television for hours a day while you are indoctrinated, It's beyond control, ladies and gentlemen. And I cannot express to you how far down the rope we have slid. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about this student who's been jailed for 13 days for a pocket knife. <laughs> and that's only the start. What part what part of totalitarianism don't you get? Good Lord, folks. You can find all these stories that I talk about up on America's Voice Now. You can also find the YouTube videos there posted on America's Voice Now, but you can also find them on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash America's Voice Now. You can communicate with me directly via email at mike at americasvoicenow.org. That's mike at americasvoicenow.org. We'll be right back. I've been doing this radio show for two and a half, almost three years. I don't understand. And, I, and, 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 you know, the things that I've been talking about, the warnings that I've given, are all coming to pass. All of them. I'm not Nostradamus. I'm not some... I'm not some... Uh... 
visionary. You don't have to be any of those things. All you have to be is logical and rational and honest. You have to be intellectually honest and willing to see the end result of where this is headed. You know, I talk to a lot of people. I speak at all kinds of meetings. I receive phone calls and emails in droves. And there's one common thread that I hear routinely, even from people who understand what's coming and what's happening and what's happened. And it is this. They're afraid. They're afraid to speak. They're afraid to take action. They're afraid to rise up. I mean, we're hearing about American Spring happening in April. And the common thread I hear through many is it's really intended to get all the patriots in one place so that they can, whatever, figure out who they all are or something worse. The truth is, I don't think this country has the courage that it's going to take to right this ship. And because they're doing it in a nonviolent way, we will slowly die and go down into that dark night without a fight, without so much as a whimper, much less a yell. It's happening everywhere. And it's not just one element or two elements or ten or even a hundred. It's abuse from every corner and every aspect. It is complete and utter insanity. And it's insanity because we, the American people, refuse to stand up and fight back for ourselves in our own defense. We refuse to believe that we've turned into a police state. We refuse to take off the blinders and acknowledge that which is right in front of us. We don't want to lift the mask. We fear the truth because we're complacent. We're afraid to admit If we take off the mask, it's going to necessitate us to take action that will endanger us and it will threaten our comfy little cocoon of apathy, of the ease that we have, of what we value, which is what? Things. Consumerism. What is all of that worth? I mean, is that really worth the future of our nation? Is your life, is your possessions, is your job, is your church, is your whatever it is that you value, whatever it is that you latch onto so dearly, is all of that, is the peace of slavery so sweet to you that you will purchase it at the price of chains and slavery, at the price of your freedom, your liberty? Ask yourself that question. You know, I have people say to me, you're, you, what you say on the air is, you know, dangerous. You're going to get shot or arrested or something. Maybe so. But if there were 10 million of us saying the same thing, if there were 20 million of us, if there were 50 million of us, who all see it, all know it, all feel it, I 
wouldn't have to. This 18-year-old kid, you want proof? I'm gonna give it to you. He's at school. <clears throat> he's, in an, he's in a vocational technical school in Ohio. He's a high school senior. Clearly an overachiever. This is the kid who's taken firefighter, two different firefighter courses, an EMT course, and he's already pre-joined the military. He's got a pre-join because he's not finished with high school yet. He's got certifications including the National Terror Defense Certification from FEMA, the Terror Recognition Certificate, and he's certified as an emergency vehicle operator. He's enrolled in the Future Soldiers Program, and he's scheduled to ship out in August when he graduates high school. He's already 18, but he has to graduate high school first. After he gets out of the military, his goal was to embark on police work or a fighter, firefighter, or it's firefighter EMT. So <clears throat> on December 12th, the administrators at his school called him into the office. This is near Cleveland. It's in Jefferson, Ohio. And they got some uh, alleged, no one really knows what the truth of this is, but they questioned him after allegedly receiving tips about some videos he had uploaded to his YouTube account. And the clips that are up there are some video games and some merchandise stuff and home defense tactics and an interview with a local police officer. This is what he told the Washington Post. The principal said he had reason to believe I had weapons in my vehicle and needed to search it. He made me empty out all my pockets. And the vice principal grabbed me and patted me down very forcibly. It was somewhat awkward. Then they took my car keys, and I told them what was in my car, and I said, don't be alarmed. He did not give them permission to search his vehicle, but they did it anyway. They said that they didn't need a warrant because the school handbook was the warrant. Really? So when they went into his car, they found a pocket, a, a, a folding uh, pocket knife, a stun gun, and two airsoft pistols, these toy, uh, they shoot plastic pellets. <clears throat> the kid had told them that the stun gun was for self-defense, and, and, the, and the pocket knife was part of his EMT kit. Now, as far as the, uh, the airsoft guns go, these are sold, it's like paintball, and they sell them in Walmart. Nobody construes them to be a weapon. They've got a big red plastic uh, tip on them so that no one can mistakenly expect or believe that they're anything other than a toy. The stun gun was locked in his glove box. Not just in the glove box, but locked in the glove box. The knife was inside of his EMT medical vest, and it was sitting there in a pocket. He had bought it at Walmart. And it was part of his first responder kit because it had a, a, a blade in there that you could cut seatbelts with. One of those uh, exposed blades that's got a shield over it. Standard EMT fare. Kid's 18 now. Let's not make any mistakes about this. He didn't have any of this stuff that would, he was not prohibited from having any of this stuff because of he, him being underage. And it was in his car. He was not carrying it on his person. It was not in the school. They arrested him and jailed him for the illegal conveyance of a weapon onto school grounds. It's a class five felony. They, the the uh, assistant uh, prosecutor at the, uh, at the county prosecutor's office said the charge, the felony, uh, felony charge for possession of a legal conveyance of a weapon onto a school ground is related only to the pocket knife because none of the other stuff is illegal. Frankly, neither is the pocket knife. Here's what Weiser told the Huffington Post. I was in jail for almost 13 days. The first bond hearing I went to was on December 15th. The judge ordered me to be held on a half million dollar bond pending a psychological evaluation. I did that and passed. 
they found that I was not suicidal, homicidal, or a threat to anyone. My attorney brought it up in front of a different judge who let me out on a $50,000 bond and an ankle monitor. I was released from jail on Christmas Eve. There are kids at my school, he says, all the time who get caught with knives, and they're suspended. My school is very rural, and people carry knives. I can accept the fact that, that, w- that there was a lapse in judgment, and I can accept the punishment. But I have already been expelled from both the tech school and my home school. The tech school declined to discuss the case. Why was he expelled when other kids were suspended? Why was he charged when other kids were suspended? Why was all of this happening when it was in his car, locked in a vest that clearly had an intended use that was related to his career choice? Now the Army has discharged him, even though they haven't actually taken possession of his body yet, And they've discharged him pending either a not guilty uh, verdict or if the charges are dropped without prejudice from the prosecutor's office. The poor kid says, if I'm convicted of a felony, I'm never going to be a police officer. I'm never going to be a fireman. I'm never going to be in the military. I won't even be able to be a janitor. I'm 18 years old, and this is going to ruin my entire life. It gets worse. Because of the fact that he's on bond, the judge said that he cannot have any firearms in his parents' home. And they required his parents to remove the firearms and put them at his grandparents' house. Then he went before another judge. And that judge freaked out about him even knowing what a gun was, and he put a no-contact order against him and his grandparents'. The rub is his grandfather is dying of cancer right now, and he's not allowed to be within 500 feet of his grandfather. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, this is the height of irresponsibility on the part of law enforcement. It's the height of irresponsibility on the part of the people who can adjudicate and resolve this case with good, old-fashioned common sense. Someone put up a petition Within 48 hours, it had 1,350 signatures. Then the kid finally said, please close the petition. You know why? Wait till you hear this. The court threatened to hold sanctions against him and his lawyer because the prosecutor didn't like the fact that his inbox was flooded with mail from people who were saying, this is insane. So now they've placed a gag order or an effective gag order against the kid. Not that they've ordered him not to talk, but that they've threatened him with sanctions. You know what sanctions are in this case? Well, they can either add to the charges. I guarantee you, I know exactly how they are operating this. They're saying, if you don't drop this, then we're going to charge you with a stun gun on the property. Or we'll find some other thing that we can charge you with. Or we will gag order you. Ladies and gentlemen, what part of intimidation on the part of law enforcement don't you get? When law enforcement holds a gun to your head and says, this is what you will do, or we will punish you so severely, you'll wish you were never born. That, ladies and gentlemen, is not freedom. It's not liberty. It's not the United States that I live in. The prosecutor has come forward and said he's aware that there are a lot of people out there who just think that we're the devil because we're allegedly ruining this young kid's life. Yeah, pretty much. But he insists that it's not the case and that the felony charge, felony charge, is justified and that he has no intentions of dropping it or reducing the charge to something else. Here's how he justifies it. There are all these school occurrences where people are shot. 
People are killed by other students. We see it every day. So we don't take these things lightly. We have to be sure that we don't have a potential for something like that to happen here. So let's not worry about the life of one. Let's not worry about the the protection of the rights of the smallest minority. Let's punish this kid because there's a potential for him to possibly cause a problem. The kid actually is offended by the prosecutor's characterization of him, and he says so. He says, I was enlisted in the Army, and I went to school to be a police officer and a fireman. Why are they trying to paint me as a potential school shooter? I never had any intentions of hurting anyone. He's scheduled to appear in court again on April 1 for a pretrial hearing. And a jury trial is scheduled for June 11th. The kid's final words in the article are, Never in my life did I think this would happen. I dedicated my life to public service. And now a four-inch pocket knife could ruin everything. Well, you're absolutely right. A four-inch pocket knife could ruin everything. But not because a four-inch pocket knife is the problem, Jordan. You see, Jordan, the real problem here is something else. It's that individuals with power and authority are so drunken on it and so completely out of touch with reality that they would utilize something as inanimate as a pocket knife, as a means and a methodology to destroy you because they've lost contact and touch with the reality of the world that they live in. They're so embroiled in the goal of achieving the law at all costs that no common sense is used. Having found myself in this situation, having been abused by the same system, having been unjustly prosecuted for something I didn't do, having paid a price far greater than Jordan Weiser will, and having those same painful final results, which are your life is ruined, you'll never work for any, of any, in any kind of substantial job ever again. I know exactly where the kid's coming from. And I feel for him in a way that I cannot even express. I can tell you what's been done, what's been done to him violates the Eighth Amendment's limitations against cruel and unusual punishment, and he hasn't even been found guilty yet. I can tell you that law enforcement across the country is not interested in justice anymore. Now they're interested in the Machiavellian principle of the ends justify the means, and they just don't care. They don't care about what's right. They only care about the fact that they can hold up a piece of paper and say, but the law says this. But if the law doesn't make sense, then why would you follow it? If I passed a law that said you should jump off the George Washington Bridge, would you do it? But you see, America, you're all complacent. And you're all willing to sit here and say, well, I'm a law-abiding citizen. Law-abiding to what? Tyranny? Law-abiding to what? Just because a tyrant passes a law doesn't make it right. Saudi Arabia has laws against women driving. Does that make it right? Well, that's Saudi Arabia. That's different. Is it really? Is it? How long before we are Saudi Arabia? How long before we have the most unreasonable laws passed that, again, you will acquiesce to quietly? Well, I guess it does make sense, you know. There is that point zero 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 one chance.
When the rule of law and the protection of the smallest minority, the minority of one, and the rights and the privileges and the, the natural freedoms and liberties that one person has are derogatorily stripped from that person for the benefit of the, the whole, but not even under a realistic benefit, under the, the panicking, insanity, fearful possibility that one individual may act in a way that's pre-crime ladies and gentlemen and if you're willing to acquiesce to that we got nothing further to talk about nothing find some other channel to listen to find somebody else to give you a massage a mental massage I'm not about mental massages. I'm about jolting you awake and saying, wake from your dream. The house is aflame. The bullets are flying. The water is rising. The earth is opened. Awaken and protect and defend yourself. If you don't call this tyranny, if you don't call this authoritarianism, if you don't call this totalitarianism, if you don't call this a police state, then I'm asking you, give me a better word. Give me a better definition. Come up with a justification for this. And this, not just this case, there are tens of thousands of cases like this rampantly raging through our courts and our society right now. Find me justification for them. Find me a reason. Find me logic. Find me rationale. Find me legitimacy. Find me authority. Moral, ethical authority it does not exist and on that topic my email will be silent because it doesn't exist Jordan Weiser on behalf of truth and honor and justice, I apologize to you in advance on behalf of the nation. And I apologize to you because we've let you down. And I apologize to you because we've been afraid to stand up and stop what we all know to be wrong. And you cannot give your forgiveness because we have not yet done the right thing to amend it. We have not made amends yet because the behavior continues and we still cower in fear. God help us. How will we ever justify this? How do we allow this to go on, America? How do we look this young man in the eye and tell him that we're going to hand him off a world that's worthwhile? We'll be right back. You're listening to America's Voice now. Educate, encourage, enable the power. 
We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Thanks for joining us, America. You're listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael Evans, and I'll be your host this morning. You're joining us in the third of four segments. If you're just uh, catching up to us, we are... um, We are looking at things which are just terrifying in what's happening with our nation. And I'm going to introduce you in this segment to your future master. Because um, these kids that are being raised today are being groomed to be a one of two things either a cog in the wheel of tyranny uh, tyranny, or an acquiescent quiet slave those who have the psychological aberration that they that they need like a drug power and authority they will be your masters and everyone else is being injected injected with the mind numbing apathy and the indoctrination that it's okay to be a slave The benefits outweigh the negatives. This story is about a a woman who was appalled when she read an essay asking eighth graders if they'd rather be slaves or factory owners. And I read the entire story. It's posted up on our Facebook page, and I want you to read it. Post it up on America's Voice Now, Facebook, and uh, Patriot FB. And I want you to read it because the part that they've really not articulated here is not that these kids were asked this question. That seems to be the outrage of the story. But because it's written by CBS, they never asked the question, why would our youth possibly believe that it's a it's better to choose slavery because those slaves had free housing free food and they had free protection god help us what are we thinking we as a nation as a society, are cooked. We're finished. Because if this is the way that our children think now, due exclusively to the indoctrination of the dependence addiction that they are taught in schools, in media, in television, in churches, in churches because if this is the way that our kids think based on the indoctrination of the dependence addiction that we have injected into them like a drug then we are flipping done as a nation this is the result of your common core this is the result of your new education this is the result 
of your leftist liberalism. This is the result of the brain damage that you were injecting into our society. This is the common core, all right. A common mentality that enslavement is better than liberty and freedom. Than self-governance and self-reliance and independence. We have fallen. And the empirical evidence to prove that point is so vast, so overwhelming, so mountainous, so obvious. We cannot avoid the truth. You can hide from it. You can run from it. You can pretend it's not happening. But it's because you refuse to believe that we've turned our nation into an enslavement state. Because you won't lift the mask off of your eyes. Because you fear the truth and you've become complacent and co-opted. And you are fearful. You are fearful to necessitate the action that will endanger that which you so treasure. Your precious. Precious what? Precious peace? Precious enslavement to an indoctrination box that sits in every room in your home? This happened in Detroit. His mother is fuming over the fact that these middle school students in eighth grade were given, these, were given this essay question, and it was determined that the question had to be answered as in-class work. It wasn't allowed to be taken home. I wonder why. Now, the woman is black, and obviously her, ch her daughter is. And she's got a 13-year-old daughter who attends this Novi Middle School. And she couldn't believe that this eighth grade American history assignment asked the students, which would you rather be, a slave or a factory worker during the Industrial Revolution? Now, the remainder of the article, because it's written by CBS, completely ignores the one aspect of this that they should be asking. We'll get to that in a moment. So the question was, an essay for in-class work, don't let the moms and dads see, which would you rather be, a slave or a factory worker during the Industrial Revolution? And the mother's response which I understand her outrage, but I think she missed the greater point. Here's what she said. The first thing I thought was, how can you even compare the two? As far as I'm concerned, they are diametrically opposing circumstances. You have on one end a slave that is not free, who has no free will. And on the other end, you have a factory worker, and although it was in the Industrial Revolution, they still had a free choice, and they had a choice to walk away if they wanted to. Steve Matthews, he's the superintendent of this Novi Community School District. The word community in the school district perhaps ought to be comrade. And he says the essay was based on a Michigan content expectation. Ah, subtle words for common core. It's a state-led initiative, I promise. The Michigan content expectation says that eighth grade students 
should be able to explain the differences in the lives of free blacks, including those who escaped from slavery, with the lives of free whites and enslaved people. Now, the mother has taken the time to independently teach her, her daughter about African-American history. And her daughter came home upset, offended, and in tears. Here's why. The majority of the class felt that they would rather be a slave than a factory worker. Let me say that for you again. Because, you know, there's no DVR on a radio and you can't back it up. But I'm going to say it for you again. The majority of the class felt that they would rather be a slave than to be a factory worker. From here, the story just descends into insanity because the mother says the daughter was extremely confused by that, knowing what slaves went through. She couldn't understand why anyone would choose that. The rationale by those students to choose slavery was that they had free housing, free food, and they had free protection. But the argument that she and I put forth was that those things were not free. I'm not arguing with her positioning. I'm arguing with the fact that no one in this entire story is taking umbrage that our children actually believe that they would rather be slaves for free housing, free food, and free protection over independence, free will, self-reliance, self-governance. See, they're pointing to it and they're saying, but these kids just don't understand that that came with a price. The price of giving up your freedom. But I'm asking the question, why would a majority of the class believe that that was appropriate? Let's forget explaining to them why it's not appropriate. I got to question the fact that they even have that concept in their minds. So the mother had a meeting with the school's principal, Stephanie Schreiner. Well, she didn't feel like her address, her concerns were addressed properly. And this whole thing is just so frustrating. She didn't feel like the, the, uh, principal addressed it properly so she brought it up to the school board and uh, here's what she said I have four kids that are in that school system and I've had issues in the past from a racial standpoint and I've always addressed it I feel that it was an unfair question to begin with and I don't want anyone to have to endure the pain that my daughter had to endure when she was asked to write this essay We have children that have impressionable minds, and I want to make sure that the impressions that we leave on them are accurate and truthful and honest. With all due respect, this is not a black issue and a white issue. This is not an issue of history. This is an issue of present existence. mother went on to say that when we're educating students, we need to make sure that we're educating all the students and not just the majority. We need to understand how the minority feels. 
No one should have to be asked a question as to whether you would want to be free or not free. As far as I'm concerned, there's a simple response, and that's that you'd rather be free. Yet the students were saying that they would rather be slaves, and to me, whatever the school was trying to extract out of this assignment, they're not there yet. I'd say they're not there yet. They're not even in the right universe, ma'am. You see, what they should be teaching the children is that under no circumstances is there any condition under which slavery would be tolerable over freedom. And the following reasons. But they're couching it all under black versus white issues, and it's not. James went on to ask, this mother, her name is James, Mrs. James, and she asked the principal, Stephanie Schreiner, if she thought the question would still stand, the way it was written, if it were applied to the Jewish, Jewish Holocaust. The principal dismissed that argument, saying the focus is on American history, which goes to show you exactly where this principal's mindset is at. And it's not just her mindset, ladies and gentlemen. It is the education system throughout the nation. You see, they're talking about a symptom, but they're ignoring the disease. The disease is not about black and white. The disease is not about uh, historical slavery. The disease is about willingness to accept and acquiesce yourself to slavery. And why would our, a majority of our children believe that free food and housing and protection is worthy of that trade? That you would give your virtue, your life, for those comforts. <laughs> I'm appalled. I am just stunned. Because I look back at Samuel Adams, who said to us, if you love wealth better than you love your liberty, if you love the tranquility of servitude, better than the animating contest of freedom, then go from us in peace. God, don't you see? <laughs> if you love free housing and free food and free protection, better than liberty, if you love servitude, if you love quiet acquiescence to the inhumane, the inhuman, against the principles that separate us and make us sentient and independent in our thought, who give us free will, your right to see and function and do as the best you can with your life. If you love wealth, free housing, free food, free protection, better than liberty, better than the animating contest of freedom, which you may win or lose based upon your own ability, based upon your faith, your ability to strive, your willingness to stand, your willingness to strive. And... Just go from us in peace. Uh, we don't want your counsel, nor your arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you, and may your chains set lightly upon you. And may posterity forget that you are our countrymen. That phrase... That statement should be the only thing necessary to respond to this entire article.
why don't the teachers read that? These children are growing up to become our overseers. These children are growing to be our leaders. And they haven't even understood yet at 13 years old and therefore never will understood the animating contest of freedom. They will never know that failure is only the beginning of success. That striving and failing is the teaching that enables you to succeed the next time around. They will never know the joy and the heartache of failure and or success. Never. Because they've been apathized. They've been convinced that slavery is better than liberty. It's better than freedom. And that they should fear the animating contest. We can't even angrily reject it because this is what we let them learn. And the cost of this and the fault of this falls back on us. You see, at 13, they're only learning what we teach them. And we have failed. We have failed them. We have failed ourselves. We have failed our past. And we have failed our future. And we have no one to blame but us. We're going to take a break. You can contact me at Mike at americasvoicenow.org. You can catch this on YouTube. Share it with some friends. If you learned anything, if you felt like there was any spark, do so. Snowden's dropped another bombshell. What I find the most disturbing about the bombshell is not the fact that it's revelatory, not the fact that it's 
terrifying. Not the fact that it's unethical, immoral, illegal, unconstitutional, and against the very fabric and nature of freedom and liberty itself. What I'm most incensed about is that most Americans just don't give a darn. <sighs> it's not that this NSA and the CIA and the surveillance police state are growing around us. See, I expect evil people to do evil things. I even expect people to be caught up in evil and not quite realize maybe that they're doing evil because, you know, they've just been indoctrinated so long they just don't get it. I don't give them a pass for that. I just understand that it can happen. But what I don't understand is what part of this empirical mountains of evidence don't you get? What part of an exposure of tyranny like this that generates another collective yawn from the apathetic masses. <laughs> Who just don't get the fact that all of this has one purpose and one purpose alone, to do you harm. And yet, they'll all just willingly sit back, collective, I don't know, right? <laughs> I don't care. Uh, where's my iPod? Uh, anybody see my car keys? Hey, you guys want to go get a six-pack, man? Hey, what do you say we drive over to that store and, you know, they just started selling weed over there, man. We can, uh, you know, now that they made it legal, we just stay high all day. I mean, who cares if NSA is spying on our Facebook pages, man? Because, you know, the only thing they could have gotten us for before was smoking dope. You know, now that it's legal, hey, who cares, man? When you take this in context, and you look at this... And you need to read the details about this. And, and, and so I encourage you to, I, I, but I don't want to go through the article on a you know, case-by-case -case basis or section-by-section. -section. Because I think the message here is bigger than that. We've already seen PRISM and Main Core. I mean, why are we waiting for another revelation. I mean, that's like sitting in there and saying, well, you know, <clears throat> we don't really need to prosecute this, this murderer, man, because, you know, he hasn't committed enough of them yet. Are you waiting until the victim is one of your children? Or your husband? Or your wife? Are you waiting until the victim is your city? Your pet project? Your school? The victim is the nation. We're all the victim. And I'm not one of those people that believes in victimhood. Not by any stretch of the imagination.
But why is America sitting here, apathetic, completely disinterested in their own demise? I mean, what the hell are you people taking that would allow you to sit here and quietly, silently, willingly acquiesce to the unconscionable? No. No one will ever hear this. It just bounces around in this tiny little closet. I watch the YouTube numbers. I watch the Spreaker numbers. There aren't a handful of you that'll hear this. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's my delivery. I don't know. Maybe it's... Uh, I don't know. But I know this. Irrespective of how stunted and how small this program is I can stand in front of my nation and I can stand in front of my creator and I can stand in front of my mirror and I can say I rode through the streets and I cried, awaken. I can say, with good conscience, that I gave a darn enough about my fellow countrymen, that I cared enough about people I don't know, and people I'll never meet, and people I will never possibly know in the future. And I can say that I respected the deaths of three and a half million of my ancestors. That I was willing to speak. That I cared enough. That my protestations and my alert and my cry for awakening may have fallen upon deaf ears unwilling ears, silenced ears. But not for want of trying. Not because I cowered in fear. Not because I feared the loss of my liberty or my property or my things. Not because I feared my life. some point many others will stand and perhaps say the same but today those numbers are small and I'm not taking anything from any of you that are listening here that I know many of you are out there doing what you're doing and to the best of your ability But we are 
silenced. We are we are selling something that the masses don't want. They fear the animating contest of freedom because it's easy. It's easy to be taken care of. It's easy to sit back and just... You don't even have to touch the check. You just get the card. You don't have to use your brain to be constructive at a workplace. You don't have to apply critical thought to work at a concept or an idea or a principle and to be introspective, to fight, to defend it. Maybe there are some of us that just like to fight. I don't know. But there's a certain percentage of us that just can't quit. The only thing I can say to those of you who do is that you can thank God that the rest of us, that small kernel, that small seed, don't. Because nothing would give you the ability to wallow in your own apathetic misery except our stance to give you that right. And the fact that you dishonor it, that you abuse it, that you would wallow in that mire of self-pity is insult enough. You can break my back. You can seal my lips. You can chain me and cuff me and lock me away. You can silence me. You can shut me down and make sure that nobody gets to hear what I have to say. And the truth of the matter is, when you do that, you show me that you fear me. You show me that these words matter. That you don't dare allow those those who would sit there and wallow in that mire, to ever be given the hand that says, rise from that mud. Stand. Be responsible. Take responsibility for what and who you are. And never forget that you are unique in all the known universe. No one has ever come before you and no one will ever come after you. 
that has your unique qualities, that has your mind, your spirit, your heart, none. Whether you believe in divine creation or whether you believe in universal cos cosmic karma makes no difference. How you got here, where you got here, and where you're going doesn't make any difference. What does make a difference is the fact that you are unique. And if you squander that, if you squander that and you throw those pearls before swine because you are afraid to stand, then you have spit in the face of either your God or the magic of the universe. You have slapped that which has given you that free will, that independence, that spirit, that belief, that freedom. And you have traded it all away to be taken care of. And you're willing to acquiesce to the beatings as long as you don't have to stand up and fight for your own benefit. <sighs> There's no handcuffs in the world. There are no cuffs in the world that can chain your mind, that can chain your spirit. The only thing that can imprison you is you. The only thing that can shut you down, the only thing that can hold you back, the only thing that can make you agree to that which is unspeakable is you. What is this life if not to strive? What is this life if not to endeavor to be better than even you think you are? What is this life if not to have and be able to make your own best interest rise forth where is your sense of self defense where is your spirit of self preservation if you were injured your instincts of self preservation would kick in get into a car wreck see the flames rising in the back of the vehicle and your instinct tells you flee get away fight to live a building falls on you and you're trapped in a space and you work and fight to live why For what? 
You fight to live to be a slave? You fight to live to allow others to take that freedom and that liberty from you? To what end? What's the point? You're thrown in water. And you swim. It's a natural response. Instinct kicks in. The animal in us says, I've got to survive. But if you allow your mind and your spirit to be slaughtered, then why allow your body to live? To what end? To what purpose? You don't hear me throw a lot of religious connotations into these discussions. But I am reminded of a phrase or a, a scripture that is particularly pertinent here. But it's a different way of looking at it. What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And your soul, while you are here, is that which makes you strive for freedom, liberty, the right to be just left alone, so that you can pursue your highest and best. So what would it profit you if you gain all the free food and the free what does it profit you if you gain all these possessions but you are a slave and a prisoner if you are unwilling to take the risk to break free of your chains for fear that you may be killed for fear that you may be injured wounded, imprisoned penalized your things taken from you audited then you actually love wealth better than liberty you love security better than liberty you love apathy better than liberty and you love the tranquility of servitude better than you do the animating contest of freedom and I ask you to go from us in peace crouch down and lick that hand which feeds you whatever hand that may be. May your chain set lightly upon you now and in the future. And may posterity forever forget that you were our countrymen. You've been listening to America's Voice. I know that's a bold claim, but somebody's got to say it. The, the question here is, where do you stand? 